Hello everyone, this is Ryan Roy. I think I speak for all users when I say that it's about time. Lightwave 2018 is finally here, and I've had the pleasure of getting my hands on a copy of it prior to release so that I could produce this video for you all on launch day. The purpose of this content is to get you up to speed on what has changed and where things are different, so think of this as less of a tutorial and more of a tour. While I can't possibly cover everything in a single video, Hopefully you'll have a solid understanding of what to expect from this version of Lightwave when we're done here. Let's begin in layout and start with the visual differences. The OpenGL viewport has received a substantial upgrade. It is now possible to preview things like normal map details and subsurface scattering on your model. The number of OpenGL lights you can have enabled has been increased to 256, and they more accurately represent the kind of lighting you can expect from your renders. Thanks to a new PBR-based OpenGL shader and a geometry engine rewrite, overall application performance has been noticeably increased in various ways. Playback speed feels somewhere between 20 to 40 percent faster depending on the scene and what's involved. This side-by-side -side comparison pretty much speaks for itself. Many of the panels in Lightwave have changed, so let's take a look at them one by one and see where and why these changes were made. Among the first changes that you'll probably notice is in the Properties panel. The Geometry, Deform, and Edges tabs have all been merged together to better accommodate Lightwave's new features. Anything in these lists here can be reordered, and this works from top to bottom. So if I put Subdivision at the very top of this list, it'll be applied before everything else. You are no longer restricted to predetermined options like before. Furthermore, you can now rename any entries contained within this list, extremely useful for when you have multiple instances of a particular deformer or motion modifier and want to be able to differentiate between them. The primitive type pulldown list is new to this version. It only appears for nulls and serves as a way to alter their function. If you work with other programs that generate smoke, fire, or fluid effects, you can now load OpenVDB files into your scene. Shape is really cool. Think of it as a simple way to throw geometry directly into layout. Nulls that are set to be shapes are only visible in VPR or renders. They have their own UV maps so that you can texture them as needed, and since shapes are embedded into the scene, these don't require a separate object file to function. Although the shapes that you can use are limited to what you can see in this list, it is possible to write in custom shapes using the Software Developers Kit. The pros and cons of shapes are outlined in the user manual, so refer to that before you attempt to do something like instance or node edit them. Nulls can be set to generate volumetric effects which can be used with particles. This will eventually become a complete replacement to hypervoxels, and it effectively opens up many doors in the realm of visual effects, especially considering that they render significantly faster now. If you'd prefer or need the features of hypervoxels, legacy volumetrics can still be accessed in the effects window. Just know that you cannot combine the old and new systems. Use one or the other, not both. You might have wondered at this point where custom objects went. These have been migrated into their own tab appropriately labeled as appearance. And this is where you'll apply things like item shapes. This gives me a chance to point out another interface feature that applies to all of these Lightwave tabs. When you select multiple items, every item that you have selected along with their applied properties will now be present in this list for easy access. Just as a quick tip, you can now select all instances of a particular modifier across your entire selection by holding the Alt key while clicking. Given that Lightwave's rendering system has been rebuilt from the ground up to provide better, faster, and more versatile imagery, the next area to visit is Render Properties, as this has changed a lot as well. Camera and light properties are no longer present and instead have their own respective windows. Coming from Lightwave 2015, most of the settings within the General, Render, and Global Illumination tabs should look familiar to you. The Render tab, in simplified terms, essentially grants control over how much time the Lightwave renderer spends on specific types of surfaces. If you need something like more detailed reflections, or light isn't bouncing around enough in your scene, look here. 
By default, global illumination is enabled because the new renderer handles this substantially better than before, and the main level of detail is determined by rays, which you can increase as needed to remove overall noise from your renders. Volumetrics are now globally controlled within render properties. This is also where you will apply distance fog. Volumetric lights are so much simpler to set up than before. Just enable volumetric scattering, and any lights that are set to affect volumetrics will do so. While we're on the subject, you may have noticed this Edit Nodes button in the Light Properties panel. You can now explicitly tell lights exactly how they should behave, and since nodes are a modular concept, this means that you can do some interesting things, like have the lights change color based on proximity, or change the way volumetrics look and behave. Doing things this way does come with a small learning curve, but I think you'll find the flexibility is well worth it. Moving on. The Output tab has been given a major overhaul, and people who do any kind of compositing will really enjoy being able to pick and choose what they want to save when they render without any hassle. By clicking in the Save column for Final Render, this allows you to specify a name for your images as well as where to save them. Clicking on the Name Tag icon will let you name your files based on various scene properties, and you'll get a preview for what your naming convention will look like below. Everything that you add in the Buffers tab will appear in the Output tab. Furthermore, these buffers can be previewed in VPR thanks to the addition of this pull-down menu. Surfacing is another area that has received a lot of attention. It had to, considering the rendering and geometry engines of Lightwave were effectively replaced. There is no way that I can go over all these changes in the time frame of this video, so I'm more interested in making it known where your starting points are going to be. A lot of this panel might look a little alien seeing it for the first time. The default material type in Lightwave is Principled Bidirectional Surface Distribution Function, or BSDF. This material type follows the conventions of physically based rendering, which means that it seeks to generate surfacing that behaves predictably in the widest variety of environments possible. So instead of having to alter your surfaces from shot to shot to make them work, they really should just flat out operate as you would expect. Hence the mentality behind this change. The lack of texture input buttons will likely be confusing to you coming from Lightwave 2015. It is important to understand that everything that you do here is now controlled by nodes. If I click Edit Node Graph, we will see that a principled BSDF node is connected to the material input. Double-clicking on this node will present us with the exact same properties that we see in the main Surface Editor window. While you can choose a type of material to use up here, know that all this is doing is adding the available material node from this sidebar. If you really insist on doing things the old way, the developers included a standard node which lets you skip the node editor and gives you back your texture inputs. One final thing to mention here is presets. Saving and reusing surfaces used to be a major hassle. You'd have to remember where the file you saved was, and there was no way to just browse through them. The new version of Lightwave greatly simplifies things with the addition of the preset shelf. It takes file management completely out of the picture, and it is very straightforward to use. Let's take a quick look at Modeler now. Although it's not the focus of this new version, it has received a few modifications as well. The same shaders that help improve the look and performance of layout have also been applied here. This also means that it is finally possible to view normal map details in the modeler viewport. Syncing with layout is much easier with the addition of the layout camera view. No more guessing or workarounds required to model things within the context of your animated scene. All of the array tools now give you live feedback while you are manipulating values, so the yes undo repeat routines of the past are no longer necessary. This feature has been extended to UV map creation as well. Okay, that does it for most of the major features that were added in the 2018 version of Lightwave. Again, what I've covered here isn't comprehensive, and there are plenty of other things that I think you'll really be glad the developers added. 
I look forward to both seeing and creating brand new content that will help pave the way forward as Lightwave continues to evolve.